Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to OLC TV for some more Total War Three Kingdoms Real Battle Tactic series. This time, looking at the Battle of White Wolf Mountain, fought between Cao Cao and the surviving sons of Yuan Shao under the leadership of Yuan Shang, as well as their allies in the Wuhan tribes under Ta Dun. So the preamble for this is a few years. So I'm going to be very, very general about this. If you do have any questions and want to know more detail, please drop comments below and I will fill you in with anything you wish to know. So, year is 204 CE, Yuan Shao is dead and Cao Cao has established a foothold north of the Yellow River. He has an alliance with Yuan Tan, one of Yuan Shao's sons. Yuan Shao, who has inherited Yuan Shao's titles and lands, is besieging Yuan Tan at Pingyuan. Cao Cao uses this as an opportunity to move his army up to besiege Ye. As he lays siege to Ye, Yuan Shang breaks away from his siege against Yuan Tan and advances to lift the siege on Ye. Unfortunately, Cao Cao is anticipating this, fights him in a battle, and smashes him. And so Yuan Shang has to retreat all the way up to Zhongshan. At this stage, Cao Cao, continuing his siege at Ye, asks Yuan Tan, his nominal ally, for support in the siege. However, Yuan Tan ignores Cao Cao's request seeing an opportunity to defeat his brother, heads up north to Zhongshan and smashes him in a battle, forcing him to flee to their other brother, Yuan Shi, up in Yeojo. Cao Cao captures Ye and is furious with Yuan Tan and is now looking for an opportunity to attack him. A year passes and Yuan Tan has gone back to Pingyuan and based himself at Nanpi. Cao Cao breaks the alliance with Yuan Tan and launches a lightning assault against him, fighting him at Nampi, besieging the city, and killing him. Over the next few years, from 205 to 207, Cao Cao lets loose some of his generals like Yue Jin, like Yu Jin, to go forth into Yuan Shao's lands and put down anyone who is standing against Cao Cao. At the same time over this period, he starts to increase pressure on Yuan Shang and Yuan Shi. This includes winning over people like Yan Rou, like uh, Tian Chou, who's up there, and Xiang Yu Fu, who was uh, part of the rebellion against Gong Sanzan. This means that by 207 CE, there's been a huge mutiny amongst Yuan Shang and Yuan Shi's troops, forcing them to flee their territory and go to their allies the Wuhan. Cao Cao takes massive opportunity of this, leaving behind some generals to pacify the territory. He heads right up north to the borders of China and the Wuhan territory to launch a final assault. So we're now here, 207 CE, and in the time it has taken Cao Cao to get up there and take command of the army based at Yi, Long Sanzo capital, he has had built the Pinglu Trench and the Chuanzhou Trench and the Xihe, the new river, which is part of the Chuan uh, Chuanzhou Trench. Now these were built in the preceding years and they were designed to act as basically a highway for supplies to supply the army as it makes this advance north because Cao Cao is about 700 kilometers from his base at Xu. However, Cao Cao's planned attack is to take the coastal road up across towards Chuanzhou, Haiyang, Jieshe, and then all the way north to Liuchang, where he knows his enemies are based. However, on the way there, he encounters heavy flooding, bad weather generally, which leaves the roads completely impassable. He still wants to keep going, so what he does is he gets in touch with a local leader, Tian Chou, who had based himself up in the north of uh, Yobei Ping, Yojo area um, at Wuzhong. Now, Tian Chou was a local commander warlord who had set up a sort of semi-independent state, but had come over to Cao Cao when Cao Cao uh, had advanced north. And Tian Chou being a local, he had very, very good relationship actually with the Xianbei and with the Wuhan, but Tadun had been raiding him. So he decided, I'm going to help Cao Cao, and I know a different route. And this is what he told him exactly. The road along the coast always floods in summer and autumn. The water is too deep for horses and carts, but too shallow for boats and barges. These conditions have long been a difficulty for the region. In former times, however, when the capital of the commandery of Yobei Ping was at Pingang, 
there was a road which led out by Lulong and on to Liu Chong. Since the Jianwu period 200 years ago, it has fallen into ruin, but there are still the remnants of a track which you can follow. The enemy commanders will be certain that a major army such as yours must make a direct attack from Wuzhong, and they will be confident that since you cannot advance against them now, you will be forced to withdraw. They will feel secure and will relax their preparations. If you turn your army aside, however, and go through the Lulong Pass into the gorges of the Bortan region, you will find yourself in undefended territory. The road is close and convenient, and you will be able to attack them where they least expect it. You can take Tadun's head without a single battle. So that was Tian Chou's advice. Cao Cao, wanting to crush this combined Wuhan force, which was a threat, as well as the Yuan brothers, just to make sure that he had a completely solid grasp on the northeast, takes it. He cannot, however, take his entire army. The Wuhan do have a point. To take his entire army, he needs to do a direct attack. So what he does is he takes his most elite troops and he gets them basically kitted out to be as light as possible for a mountain trek. And amongst these uh, elite troops, he obviously has his Tiger and Leopard Cavalry under the command of Cao Chun, um, who's Cao Ren's twin brother. He takes the likes of Jiang Xiu, who you remember he fought against at the Death Place in one of the earlier episodes of this series. He takes the likes of Guo Jia as his strategist. He takes Zhang Liao and uh, Xu Huang as well. Like some big names go on this campaign. Cao Cao goes up to where Tian Chou is based at Wuzhong and using Tian Chou as a guide, he follows this road all the way up through the passes past the deserted city of Pingang and heads to a place called White Wolf Mountain. As he reaches the nearing area of White Wolf Mountain, Tadun and his scouts realize they have been outmaneuvered. And so, even though Cao Cao is still planning to go to Liu Chang to besiege it, Tadun rushes his forces out, without Cao Cao knowing, to go meet him at White Wolf Mountain. And that is where they clash. Now, the battle itself. There are some debates about exactly where White Wolf Mountain is and where this battle was fought. However, I'm using uh, Rafe de Crespigny's idea of where it is. And because of the lack of direct information about where it was, the actual battlefield itself, I mean, as always with this, I don't exactly go over the top for the details, but all we know about the battlefield is that there was a slight hill that Cao Cao used as a vantage point and that the Wuhan and uh, Yuan Shao's sons together were very disarrayed. So as they approach the battlefield, Cao Cao has about 5,000 troops with him, and he's facing somewhere in the region of 100,000 to 300,000 people. Now, I must state people. Uh, the Wuhan tribes will not have been an entire fighting force. They would have had soldiers amongst them, they would have had levies amongst them, but they would have also had a number of camp followers, families, their baggage train and everything combined together. The same with Yuan Shao's sons. Yuan Shang and Yuan Shi had fled. They are taking pretty much everything with them, though they would have left key people in Liu Chang. Uh, we can assume from this 100,000 to 300,000 people that less than a third were actually fighting soldiers um, of any quality. The rest would have been made up of the sick, the injured, uh, and families and the like. But whatever happens when they arrived, Cao Cao's forces were horrendously outnumbered, and they were shaken because of this, quite understandably shaken. Cao Cao also did not expect to clash here, so as they approached, he quickly formed up his troops and went to go have a look at the formations of the Wuhan. As he was standing atop this hill, he noticed that the Wuhan were in such disarray, they had left a massive weak spot in their forces, and so Speaking to his commander of the van, who at this stage was Zhang Liao, he said to Zhang Liao, there's Tadun, get him. And Zhang Liao did just that. Zhang Liao, taking a very small number of troops compared to what he was about to fight against, went straight for the head of the snake and beheaded Tadun, destroyed the morale of the Wuhan army. It's very rare that you see in history a single charge that breaks a nation 
this is one of these times where a single charge by Zhang Liao broke the Wuhan tribes completely. Tadun had been trying to combine them into a force um, that could raid and be a unified entity on the borders. This destroyed that hope. This charge destroyed that hope. After Tadun's head had been taken and this charge had succeeded, the Wuhan were in massive disarray and any attempts to rally the troops were then met with Xu Huang and the rest of the boys charging in and taking heads. The battle then was over very, very quickly. Yuan Shang and Yuan Xi plus some of their troops fled. Anyone who didn't flee and did not surrender died. Cao Cao is estimated to have taken somewhere between 100,000 to 200,000 captives with only a handful of losses on his own side. It was a crushing victory for Cao Cao. He had used his oblique approach advised by Tian Chou. He loved the oblique approach and this oblique approach had completely outmaneuvered an entire nation. Um, he had then using one of the finest generals of the era, uh, Zhang Liao, to break the entire Wuhan charge despite being heavily outnumbered and won himself one of the greatest victories he ever achieved and certainly one of the greatest victories in the ancient world at this time, I believe. Now the aftermath of this battle is not so happy for all, all uh, sides involved. Due to being so far away from their supply lines and having to take the mountain road, their disease and the weather took a toll on Cao Cao's troops as they made their way back to friendly territory. Um, Zhang Xiu died, Guo Jia contracted illness and died, and Cao Cao's men were tired, exhausted even when they returned. Even the main army that he'd left in uh, Yi, when he reunited with them, then had to be marched all the way south to get ready for a campaign against uh, Liu Biao's uh, sons, essentially it would turn out to be, and Liu Bei, um, before then heading off into the Battle of Red Cliffs a year later. Uh, there are some arguments that when it came to the Battle of Red Cliffs, Cao Cao's troops were overly tired. I don't believe they were overly tired when they reached the Battle of Red Cliffs because they would have had opportunity to rest. It wasn't as if they fought it three days later. They did fight it a year later. But certainly this victory took a toll on a number of top key commanders and generals as well as a lot of his elite troops that no doubt affected how he was able to fight the campaign of Red Cliffs. Especially the loss of Gorjia, who Cao Cao quite famously... Uh, states, though whether this is a true statement or one of these fictional things that have come up over time, um, he is said to have stated that had Gorjia lived, he would have won the Battle of Red Cliffs. So certainly that was a great loss for Cao Cao, uh, losing one of his key strategists. On the other side, the Wuhan were completely cowed, as were the Xiangbei who heard about this great victory. And Cao Cao essentially managed to absorb the Wuhan into his grasp very shortly after that and they became solid mercenaries and regular cavalry troops in his armies from this point onwards. Uh, Yuan Shang and Yuan Shi as well as some other uh, Wuhan commanders who had not surrendered to Cao Cao at that time fled uh, to Gongsun Kang's territory that's uh, the successor to Gongsun Du and Cao Cao was advised not to launch an attack on uh, Gongsun Kang and he completely agreed. Uh, his idea was that Gongsun Kang, if he was pressed by Cao Cao, he would fight back and it would be a long and costly war. But if he left, the Yuan brothers would overstay their welcome and Gongsun Kang would send their heads to Cao Cao. And that's exactly what happened. All of the commanders that did not bow to Cao Cao and who ran to Gongsun Kang were executed the head sent to Cao Cao and Gongsun Kang nominally swore vassalage to Cao Cao. Uh, the Gongsuns of the Northeast uh, were not really that closely affiliated with the court anyway at this stage and Cao Cao sort of left them to their own devices but they didn't really pose a threat to Cao Cao from that point onwards. And after that of course Yuan clan was completely wiped out essentially in the northeast, leaving Cao Cao with a very solid grip on the northeast, and the opportunity then to fight his campaigns in the west to crush 
the remnants of the Liang Rebellion, uh, which includes the likes of Ma Chao and Han Sui, as well as to fight a war against Wu down in the south, Sun Quan down in the south. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you enjoyed this. This was a long one to put together to make sure I got the facts right, because there's a lot of myth going on with this one. If you do have any further questions about this, please feel free to drop questions below. I'll happily fill you in with more details. I know I did skirt over the general uh, beginning to this campaign in the beginning. Um, also, if you have any requests for any other battles or anything else you would like me to look at, please let me know in the comment section below as well. But I really hope you enjoyed this. If you have, please drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And I look forward to seeing you next time for more Total War. Thank you very much for joining me. Bye-bye.